pleased to be here. I have to say it was a it was a fantastic first first day, um, and I learned a lot. And it was a, a spectacular interactions uh, and, a, and a very pleasant uh, evening. So uh, glad to see you all back this morning, bright and bright and shiny. And I think um, at the start, um, I'd like to uh, remind you to all put again your mobile phones on silent. Um, and uh, moving on in the program, we're going to having the patient organization session this morning which I think is uh, one of the most uh, important aspects of this meeting and trying to pull the key stakeholders uh, in this disease together and exchanging on you know, where's the needs and the shortcomings, but also where are the solutions maybe. And it's my big and great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, four discussants with me this morning. Unfortunately, Achim Kautz from Germany um, is not able to participate this morning. So uh, we've invited Louise Campbell, uh, the head and founder of Tazun Health, uh, to join us. She's a registered nurse and provides uh, transient elastography um, solutions through her company. Uh, she's also the co-host of Surfing the National Tsunami. So uh, pleased to have you here this morning, Louise, and looking forward to the discussion. Uh, so the second participant is Donna Cryer. Donna Cryer is the founder and president chief Ex executive officer of the Global Liver Institute, which is a patient-driven uh, non-profit health uh, um, uh, organization uh, which operates globally uh, and importantly has, uh, covers all aspects of liver disease and is a, is a very a central key player in uh, moving uh, advocacy at the level of law uh, makers and public relations. Um, uh, the Global Liver Institute has been doing this for seven years, Donna, I just learned. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, I think there's many things that came out of this at this point uh, in the interconnectivity. So I think we can be learning from you and your experience. I'm very excited to have you here this morning. And uh, so then we have uh, two more participants, Jose Williamson, from uh, the uh, uh, who's the executive director of the Dutch Liver Patient Association. Uh, she's a board member of Liver Patients International, uh, which is an umbrella organization for liver patients and a uh, member of the managing board of the European Reference Network for Rare Liver Diseases. Um, and uh, besides that, she's a member of several national, uh, NAFLD and NASH-related platforms, been active in the field of NAFLD since 2014. Uh, so you oversee uh, this for a long time, Jose. I'm very happy to hear, have you here this morning. Thank you. And uh, our last participant uh, is Jose Villam, uh, excuse me, is Fernando Garcia Perez uh, from Spain, uh, from FNEATH. And uh, he's a, um, he has a double degree, degree in uh, psychology and criminology and um, from the Loyola University and uh, has completed his studies in part uh, in Newcastle and the US. Uh, and uh, you are a staff of the Spanish Federation of Liver Patients and Transplant, FNETH. I'm very pleased to have you here and share your experience with us. Okay, so with this and after this short introduction, uh, it's my, um, we'll just uh, dive right in and I think I'm just gonna sit with you uh, in the beginning and you know, I'd I think I'd like to open it up and we can start from the left to the right or I've prepared some questions and maybe the most burning one in the field is how can patient advocacy um, help to promote um, the gap we've been identifying, um, namely from the discussions yesterday, I think is that there's a certain loss of uh, patients or the connectivity between the disciplines. We're talking as specialists in primary care and how could uh, patient advocacy help us to overcome uh, this gap and I'd be uh, happy to learn from your insights and uh, feel free to, uh, to contribute to that. So maybe, I don't know, Donna, you wanna, wanna start out and... Uh... <clears throat> So the organization as a whole, the Global Liver Institute, um, is I'm a little over seven years old. And uh, our tagline is it all starts with a patient, which at this point is a little bit of a double entente because it certainly did start with my patient's story uh, and me thinking you know, at uh, the point I was 20 years post-transplant that there wasn't, as we've been talking today, that there wasn't the level of advocacy for liver patients that we needed to carry all of this work forward. And so we uh, operate at this point in, um, in the structures of councils. And I'm only setting this up so that you understand the different types of things that we can do and the different ways that we can partner with, with others. So we started with um, a council in liver cancer, um, having acquired a, a hepatobiliary cancers organization, um, and that purposefully 
brings uh, not only patients, but industry partners, researchers, hospitals, um, and advocacy organizations, large and small, um, to the table to see, uh, to set a common agenda and to leverage everyone's internal capacities. And then uh, GLI's position is then will sort of take on as an organization sort of things, things that are left, but really to solve the, the problems of fragmentation and silo that we feel have um, really limited the liver field as a whole um, is the prob key problem that we've been trying to solve for patients. Enter in NASH, and you know, I brought materials for people to, to, to share and take a look at. Um, you know, we launched our NASH Council in 2017, um, and we wanted to give uh, credit and acknowledgement to the work that ELPA had done in uh, launching a NAFLD summit. And so invited Marco um, to present at the launch of, of our NASH Council um, at the Milken Institute of Public Health. And that was also very deliberate, that we wanted to put NASH in a public health perspective um, from the very beginning. Um, and those early meetings uh, and early members um, were from cardiology and endocrinology. Uh, with all due respect, I sort of got a, a round to involving hepatology. I, I figured they would come to the table eventually. But um, my first call was to uh, my friend Nancy Brown, who's head of the American Heart Association, and we see just um, in April, um, a large uh, scientific official statement from the American Heart Association on, um, on NAFLD, but that took many years in, in the works. So um, to be able to both create a coalition where um, different stakeholder groups, um, different disciplines, starting with those who are you know, NASH adjacent, if you will, in endocrine and uh, and, and cardiology, and then also for us, as, as you've heard, have been members um, of other organizations. But I think that that collaborative spirit is really, um, you know, how we hope to address not only NASH but liver health as a whole. Yeah, so that's very interesting. You think the cardiologists were just more ready for patient engagement? Were they more used to that? Was there? A no, they weren't. They weren't. I have my, my secret weapon, perhaps maybe, that my husband is an expert in lipid metabolism okay. and helped develop Provacol. And so the first few calls were, um, well, the American Heart Association, that you know, relationship, they're like, we'll send somebody, but they didn't really get it. The endocrinologists were like, that's not our p patients. Do you know who we are? And I finally just, can you just come? But the aha moments in that first meeting at the School of Public Health when they were like, oh, you're right, these are our patients, and they've been some of our most active members in the council. Look, Ken Cousy, for example, um, has been an active member in our council from the beginning. Okay. So that's the U.S. side, and you started locally, Jose and uh, Fernando from, from, from the European side, ELPA. I think, Jose, uh, Jose, you have been involved in ELPA also extensively together, putting this to... Uh, well, we left ELPA some years ago, okay. and we started uh, Liver Patient International. It's a new... Oh. Use the microphone. Um, we, uh, a few organizations left ELPA some years ago for certain reasons, and we started a new organization and to focus more also on the patient and the patient stories. And we want to help uh, patient organizations because you have small ones, bigger ones, and a lot, a lot of patient organizations have the problem that they, well, it started with a Facebook group and then they became bigger and suddenly they were a patient organization. And so that's what we want to help. And we have a lot of experience because we all, uh, our leads from uh, patient organizations. So providing information, advocacy, but, so, but we are also there to listen and to give advice if needed, but very often listening is enough for patients. And the advocacy is more like that, well, that's my task, um, not only in the Netherlands, but also in Europe and maybe globally is to let people know what par patient participation is. I'm a patient advocate, and I will tell you what people need, what patients need, not what they want, because that's, well, you can want everything in the world, but really what they need, and that's a big misunderstanding, because they're all oh, but you tell what pe people want. Yeah, they can want everything, but it's what they need. So that's about the gaps in the care, 
for patients. And we try to, well, to close the bridge uh, or, or to, to make a bridge between healthcare professionals, also the, the well, the government, the healthcare uh, systems, and the need of patients. So, so you mentioned two very important points from my uh, perspective, because as a physician, I would think that I would know what my patient needs, but uh, maybe don't. I don't. <laughs> no. So where's the gap I, here? I mean, what is the well, patient approaching the physician, but not uh, the other way around? Yeah. Well, let's first start, we need each other. And, and you focus, as doctors, you focus on the test results. Keep that doing because that's very important. But there's always a missing part because that's for you very important as a physician. But for the patient, the needs are different. It's about can I go to work? Can I have uh, children? Uh, what do I do with my social life? Because liver patients are too tired to do anything, so they stay at home, feel lonely. Uh, because um, you always have to say no on the invitation so your friends don't ask you anymore because you, they feel sorry for you that you always have to say no. Um, and, it's, and doctors never discuss that with her patients. So how do you feel? It's so, always, it's happened so often that somebody feels horrible, went to the doctor, expect to hear what's wrong with the liver so that the test results are really bad, so that explains why they feel horrible, and they come to you and say, oh, well, well, it's not that bad, I'm very satisfied, what shall we do, three months, six months? <laughs> and then the patient is outside and says, but I feel horrible, and just to ask how do you feel, that is very often the missing link. Okay, so it's the somatic aspects the physician yeah. covers, and there is, of course, much more to a person uh, in that. <coughs> Fernando, do you, what's your thought on this, or do you have experience? And maybe how are NAFLD patients different from other patients that we're counseling in liver disease, maybe? Yeah. Um, hello. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure for me and for us uh, to be here. Um, yeah, uh, I totally agree with uh, the same that uh, Jose have, has just said. Um, the doctors and all of the specialists are so important, but uh, from our point of view, uh, patients need more, and it's not only uh, mm, the treatment or, in our case, the transplant. They need more uh, apart from that, and that's something that a mm, lot of times uh, is not happening. So uh, that's the main reason for for us to, to be here and to to work for for them, um, yeah. Also, uh, we would like to to say that um, for the in Spain, we we see that it's really important the prevention for the in in all the um, patients. Um, also, uh, we, we see as something essential, a uh, multidisciplinary um, overview and help for that kind of uh, patients because uh, they uh, really often they see each other like alone because they see the doctor and they say you they are diagnosed. Yeah. Um, they say, okay, uh, we will see each other in one year. You have to uh, eat. Uh, healthier, you have to do exercise, but they don't have any kind of help to to do the, that kind of things, and it's really difficult for them to uh, someone that is not used to that kind of routines, and um, it's really difficult for them, and they need more help in that kind of uh, things. Sure, great. Um, I just wanted to say something. Ahead. I think it it may be a little bit less what's less of what's different about NAFLD or NASH patients than what's different about NAFLD and NASH. Yeah. Um, there was no framework or structure. There was no NASH advocacy or presence just a few years ago. And so um, it, 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 you know, when you think about what are the elements of a functioning disease state, um, 
from research to regulatory, education, support, the clinical and patient workflow, which are two sides of the same coin, and then the policies to support that, none of those existed in NASH. And confounded with nobody had ever heard of NASH, um, they still may never because we may change the name or, or I don't know. But um, we were working with what we have. And so the first thing we thought was important um, for the Global Liver Institute when we looked across the liver landscape and thought, where can we add value? And why we came to NASH was the ability to establish that framework. And it wasn't that GLI would do all of these aspects, but that we would make sure that someone was on point to do them. So if the liver forum was working on preclinical research and we just did the, you know, a PFDD meeting, a patient-focused drug development meeting, and worked with FDA and EMA and had patient insights there. Um, we're all creating educational pieces. I, I brought some today in Spanish that we do, uh, highlighting those who do an excellent job at support and to the question that was posed yesterday, well, they're of all different quality. Okay, if that is um, an issue, can we help standardize that? Um, so we're working to put sort of support um, frameworks, peer mentor, education. We also have some technical ways to scale that asynchronously and also match to language and, and things like that. So just to make sure that in this field of NASH, there are all the functioning elements of a therapeutic area um, is really where we see our, our role. And they're at different stages of maturity um, as we grow as an organization as well as to scale it and as we see the field scaling and other you know, partners and entities coming in and taking on different pieces and roles of this. But I think it's Nash and it was so different because it had no, it had no framework, it had no home for patients to go to. So how would you identify yourself as a Nash patient when no one was talking about NASH, you'd never heard of NASH, what would that mean to be part of a NASH community or a NASH movement? And so now we have places for them to go and ways for them to identify with them and T-shirts and mugs and things to buy. So, um, you know, that, so I think we're, 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 getting, we're getting there, but it's less about, you know, what was lacking with the patient or different about the patient and how we needed the field to be there to support them. Sure, and I, I love your mugs. Thanks for uh, handing over one to me. <laughs> uh, um, that's great. I mean, um, this is, I think, a very um, um, well-organized way to approach the regulators, which is crucial. Uh, and I think uh, in the U.S., um, you are a little ahead of what's happening in Europe, is my perception. I'm not sure, Louise, do you, you have any insight on that, or do you want to comment how far away are we in... in, in the, maybe the challenge in Europe is, we, of course, we have to talk to different regulators, right, and, and mm. different countries. I think we do have to liaise with different regulators, and I think the role of the nurse, it was alluded to yesterday by Jean and several people, the nurses are often the people who are the last person to see the patient going out the door, the first patient to see them coming in the door, and they're the first person that the advocacy groups will contact, and I think that is the link, we're the hinge for all of the mechanisms, and I think when we talk about the regulators, we need to bring it all together, we need to be talking about advocacy. Advocacy is needed where we're not providing the best care or we're falling short of somewhere because there's a need to, to keep pitching our, our sales pitch. More people have poor liver health than have liver disease. So it's bringing it back. It's finding the problem to start with before we silo it into the diseases, whether it's endocrinology, I mentioned it yesterday, cardiology. So it is that bringing together. You will often have a consultation with the nurse in the primary care or in secondary care. You will then have a session with the doctor. It's really quite important that the doctors and the nurses liaise. Nurses are the patient's advocate. We come from a different reference framework to physicians. And physicians answer the questions that's good for the physician or the need of the disease rather than the need, as has been said, of the patient. So by having that conversation, it becomes a rounded conversation. Did Mrs. Smith tell you she was eating out three times a day? No. Well, that's, an, that's, that's a need we can solve. So that liaison at baseline level between physicians and nurses, we need to be carrying that conversation up to regulators. When we say that 55% of all advanced liver disease is diagnosed in the ED room, we have a pathway that is not working. If that was cardiology, 
the countries would be screaming if 55% of all heart disease waited until you had a cardiac arrest. We would be arguing our peace, and I think we are getting more coordinated. And, and that's the key. It is coordination. Each member state, member group, comes with a slightly different framework, but they all need to come together with the physicians, with the nurses, and advocate at the senior political level. But we really have to start to get our pathways right lower down, because that strengthens our argument later. Absolutely. And I think that's where this conference and the other conferences now come in really strong. It is about the pathway. And it is about the patient, because the patient st it starts with the person, it finishes with the person. And the only other thing I'd add about that to advocacy is I know a number of diabetic patients, they know about their diabetes, but they don't know about their cardiac, and they don't know about their NAFLD. The patient should be the centre and the expert in their disease, and it's all diseases and all risks, whereas we like to silo it. I only want to know about my diabetes care. But actually, and I think people get threatened by patients who are very empowered about their condition because they'll often know more than we, I will. But I'll hold my hands up because I learn. And let's be open to learning from advocacy groups and patient strengths. Yeah. Well, Louise, you said something very important, and that's what I face uh, for years already. You were speaking about it's about a poor liver health. In the beginning, everything was NASH. And I, what I face and what I hear from patients, yeah, my GP say I have NASH. But I looked at the websites about NASH, and they are really in shock because they will die on liver cancer tomorrow. Um, and, and then we have to explain, and, all, and they don't read very well because it's, <laughs> it's written there that you have stages. And, but in general, in healthcare, in, Still, everybody is speaking about NASH, but it's not always NASH because NASH is a, is a stage, and that's maybe something in general. Um, also, from and that's I'm speaking from the patient perspective because it's quite confusing when you think that you have a disease you will die on very soon on liver cancer because that's what you find everywhere in NASH, and that's the case. But they don't have NASH. They have, uh, and I really love that, um, a poor liver health. So, and, and that's maybe something we, I don't know. I don't have the solution. I don't have a plan ready. But I think this is really a much better um, a point of view to start with. You have a bad liver health, and then we have the stages. So there's a stage, yeah. well, you can change it, and then, so I think for patients that will be very helpful to make it much more clear what is it about. It's about your bad liver health and then you have the stages and well at the end, unfortunately, you have NASH and when you have NASH then you have really a problem. So that's... Right. I, I think that's, that's certainly always been my vision. Um, but. I think in any, you know, uh, movement, you know, you can only go as far as, as people, you yeah. know, if, if uh, you're just, uh, if you're going but nobody's following, then you're just on a long walk. So um, that, that's not a movement. And so um, I, I think, that, you know, that's why we chose to start with the disease-based councils in liver cancer in NASH and pediatric and rare liver diseases and only just um, the spring launched liver health as public health. Um, it sort of all you know, rolled in there. I also think that NASH gave an opportunity that perhaps uh, you know, hepatitis C did not give um, because NASH is by its very nature so interconnected and needs to be um, you know, in, in actively embraced by cardiology and endocrinology primary care that it does give us the opening, I felt, to talk about liver health as a whole. And so for me, success is when liver health and a burgundy ribbon is, is on par with the red dress and, you know, with heart health and with brain health. Um, and there's no reason not to. It's just those started longer I think, ago. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned something very uh, um, important to me, and it, it says it's, it's not the challenge about defining the disease or making the biopsy or something. Mm -hmm. It's the opportunity to, to provide health mm -hmm. through 
focusing on liver health. And I think that's something as a field we can maybe reflect on and saying, you know, we really, with this aspect, we're discussing improving liver health overall. And it's not the challenge that the disease is so difficult to stage or something. It's, it's much more, if you look at it from a, you know, a system perspective, mm -hmm. I guess. So I like that a lot. Um, one thing I heard uh, also from the discussion yesterday, Jean-Maurice uh, mentioned this in his uh, primary care practice and um, in some systems, uh, Louise just mentioned this, the, the role of the nurse or physician assistant mm -hmm. potentially. Now, uh, I can um, reflect on my own practice. Uh, the challenge in Germany is I don't have such a position. Mm -hmm. And um, I think here, if we're talking about healthcare systems and implementations, this could okay. be a crucial connector mm -hmm. um, on education uh, between patient advocacy and physicians. And maybe we can reflect on this in a little bit more. And, and maybe this is part of the solution to provide liver health uh, to patients after seeing the physician. I absolutely agree. You know, um, I know. Well, my team knows that I, I challenge them to find solutions that work equally well in, in Kentucky and Kenya. And the point is um, to have things that scale, um, whether you're in high resource or low resource environments. And so this issue of navigation and peer support um, in a way that is um, tailored to culture and language, but consistent enough in delivery in terms of quality. Um, is, is something that I think is very important um, for us all as a community to, to work on, to develop, and to advocate for as, as something that's really a necessity to the functioning of, of, of the field because um, it's unfair, I always feel, to have physicians held accountable for outcomes that are so far out of their control. Um, you can control or you know what your patient eats and how much activity you can recommend but ultimately the patient is the one who has to deliver on that and there's often very little feedback loop into how that's that's going and so um, if we can more uh, clearly define and formalize um, a supportive navigation um, role and it should be able to be delivered by uh, an experienced patient peer, a community health worker, a promotora, um, you know, different different models, um, but something that's scalable and deliverable in a variety of environments, I think that would be a very important part of the solution. Um, I was just going to follow up on that because um, they're all absolutely valid points. And when we talk about drug development, these drugs are not going to be developed for the middle and lower income countries realistically. But when we talk about the strengths of primary care yesterday, or the weaknesses, but we also talk about the strengths of diet and nutritional intake, these are things that we can maximize at any level in any country. Everybody has their diet. Everybody's diet <coughs> is unique. Um, if anybody's heard me on the podcast, I talk a little bit about of Aboriginal health, for example. Aboriginal health, 43% of Aboriginals had food positivity last year when we got to rural areas in Australia, 21% in cities, but they get access to low quality, high density foods. And, but you give them the opportunity within their own dietary, they change their behavior. They actually have their strengths. So what we need to do is, that any part of any pathway is maximize everything we can. Mm -hmm. Now I know a physician wants a pill, we all want a pill to be a solution, but actually we've got to only have the medication for the real people who can't alter diet and exercise. Because in these countries, it is massively more detrimental because people will go in across the poverty line if you go on a diabetic drug. That means you've really threatened the family, family security. But what we go is we've got to look at layers. So when we put in these pathways, what's the base strength? That's diet, nutrition, that's health. And it is great to have heard so much about it yesterday. But how do we maximize that and ensure that nurses, physicians, assistants, and doctors at the base level can maximize our patients' motivation in that? And then we scale up. Because at some stages, we are going to lose countries who cannot afford but are adversely affected greater because it's not in the public domain. And that's where, for me, patient advocacy is absolutely vital because that's the strength of patient advocacy in those areas where medicine really cannot get access to the sort of detection needs. 
Fib4, L, fantastic test for me or, and for you guys as physicians, but that's not what floats a patient. They like to see things, and that's one of the reasons that I now use um, FibroScan a lot, because the brief intervention, which you don't hear a lot about in research, is actually the massive part of when you deliver that message. You don't get that with things like Fib4. And that, to me, changes behavior, and that's one of the reasons I now do what I do about liver health. Most people have poor liver health, and that could include a lot of us in the room, but most of us have probably had a fiber scan because we actually access it. That is not available to most other people. Yeah, uh, totally agree. And yeah, also uh, here in Spain, we have a big problem that uh, a big amount of the, the patients they cannot afford uh, someone who helps you, who help them with uh, doing exercise or with a diet. Um, that's the big problem because yeah, they know that they they are diagnosed, they have the diagnosis, um, but they don't know how to do it. They can't do it uh, by themselves, so they need help. Um, yeah, I think it's really important. And also, someone uh, something that. Um, we comment before is that mm, patients are so confused bec uh, with that with this disease because they even know uh, which term terminology use. They don't know even here, or at least here in Spain, how to call this disease. So mm, it's really confusing for them. And there's a big lack of knowledge here in, in Spain, in the special, um, not even in the patients, also the specialists, the, the specialists that are in primary care, they, we think they need to be a more, I don't know, they need more knowledge because if not, the patient, they are alone and they don't know uh, what 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 special especially to do? They, they I, I, I think we agree. Education is is key, and um, mm -hmm. and that's one way forward. But if we're trying to think of solutions in the future, and we, we, if we go to the regulator, Stoner, and tell them, you know, we need specialist nurses uh, paid for our patients, I think they would ask you, well, uh, do you have any evidence it's effective? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and maybe we need, or maybe you know, maybe we need a small intervention. As an academic physician, I'm thinking, you know, let's do a trial and uh, have one arm uh, be provided with health care with a supporter and have the other guys run as it's done in clinical practice and show is there any difference in outcome. Maybe that has been done or maybe that's the that's a little puzzle in the solution moving forward trying to convince mm -hmm. Regulators and payers, in the end, I think Zobar Yunusi said that it's it's, mm -hmm. it's cannot all be paid by universities doing research right. or pharma companies developing drugs. We need to yeah. come have the regulators come on board for that. Absolutely. So we have a payer summit scheduled um, for uh, this summer, and um, uh, its design is is intentional. Um, the first part of the day is for patients to talk to payers, both public and private payers, um, and educate them about NASH and the liver disease and their experience. And then it's for the payers to talk to the patients about what are opportunities, having worked for a payer. And I, and I think that's sort of part of um, what distinguishes us is, you know, I'm, I sit on the board of a hospital. I've worked for payers. Um, you know, I'm a member um, of, of many boards, including the Council of Medical Specialty Societies. And so looking at healthcare across the 360 degrees, you know, what levers do we need to to pull um, to get what we need um, as, a, as a community. But certainly having conversations with payers that they're better educated about NASH and liver disease is, a, is an important um, part of this. Um, in my conversations with them, it has been um, around helping them understand um, how to um, create segments of, of, of patients so that they can better understand what types and intensities of interventions for what types of, of patients. So, um, you know, this set of patients really needs, uh, you know, a dietitian and, and a, you know, a coach. This, at this level of disease, they need a bariatric surgery consult. At this, you know, level of disease, they need to be with a hepatologist and, uh, you know, and have access to any drugs that are approved. And so if we can help them understand that, it makes it a much more manageable problem for them. It makes the, it makes the economics 
of it um, much easier for them to understand. I, I think for this, it would, I would encourage the studies that you're trying, that you're talking about, but I think we have a lot of uh, information that we can borrow from uh, community health workers and, and other types of supports in diabetes and, and in other, um, uh, in, in cardiovascular um, disease that we could bring, bring to bear um, and aren't, aren't too far off to, to apply. Jose, are you ex thinking of examples like this? Um, yeah, but, but maybe not a good one. Um, in the Netherlands, um, we have set up by the government lifestyle health programs paid by all insurance companies. So if you want to go on a diet to, to exercise, whatever, it's paid. But what we know is that it doesn't work. People don't want to go, don't want to follow because they, they don't feel safe. And to be honest, nobody asked patients, what do you want and what do you need? It's set up by healthy policymakers um, who think that they know that how to get the people healthy, and it doesn't work. And if you say, well, that's ideal, so pay that insurance, well, everybody should go, could go, nobody goes. And Jean, because the, the GPs are involved in the Netherlands also in those programs, they can send their patients to their programs. But I know that my GP <laughs> never do that. The obese patients, yeah. In my hmm? in my it's yeah. Yeah. is not enough. Okay. <clears throat> so th those combined lifestyle interventions are paid by half by the health insurances and yeah. half by the municipality. Okay. So and and uh, people with obesity in in my uh, that works there. region uh, it works. But mm. but y you're right. The development is done by academic departments of ha uh, health promoting science. Yeah. But patients are not not too much yeah, involved nobody else. in, in the I, development. Yeah, and I think when you have um, um, Nash, um, you nobody learn you about what that is. And uh, when your GP say, well, you have, well, your liver is not okay, it's too much fat, so, and send you to the program. But people don't understand what it is. They don't even know after that where the liver is, what the liver do, um, how big it is. Um, and um, so, that's really a lack in the programs. Very interesting. So we have five minutes left in the session, and I'd invite you to engage also with the, with the roundtable discussions here uh, if you want. But maybe, um, Donna, over the last years, uh, last days, I've learned that there's certain, and, and Louise and the rest, uh, there are activities that are done uh, in, in the US, for example, and maybe not all patient advocates or even physicians are informed about in Europe. So the question is, you know, moving this to the next level, moving it forward, how can we build a more, uh, you know, pow even more powerful patient advocacy platform or movement and, and, and um, enforce these or support these thoughts, you know, bringing patients into the design of uh, health um, programs and these type of activities. Do you have any ideas or thoughts on that? Well, certainly. Um, so first of all, um, you know, as I said, we from the very launch of our Nash Council, we did it in uh, partnership with with European partners. So we've always had, um, you know, active invitations out um, both to European medical societies um, as well as to European patient groups. You know, we've worked, we've been on many calls calls together. Um, we also, you know, International Nash Day has been, you know, run out of Europe for the <laughs> entirety of its existence. Um, and that was very intentional on my part. And I'm really excited today that many of you got a chance to meet Giacomo Donini, who's located in, in Italy, and, and then Robert Mitchell Thane, who is, has joined us um, now as part of Team GLI um, in the UK. And so, um, you know, International Nash Day has, you know, had endorsements from 17 different medical societies around the world. Um, but I'm happy to have a, every opportunity I have to introduce and reintroduce the organization and the opportunities to partner. Um, the, uh, we see ourselves as a catalyst and, and, and a convener. And so um, all of our councils have international 
um, work groups. Uh, Maria Reg, uh, you know, runs uh, the Liver Cancer um, International Work Group for our Liver Cancers Council. So consider this um, for everybody listening and certainly everybody in the room um, an opportunity to join any of the Global Liver Institute um, councils. Certainly, we've had many patients um, from Europe, from Mexico, from Canada, from a number of countries um, participate in our Advanced Advocacy Academy. And it's not about us keeping them for, for GLI. The, our joy and our measure of success is sending them back to their home organizations so that those organizations are stronger because now they have advocates who've been trained in you know, media and research and development and policy and how to talk to payers. Um, and so we see our role as seeding that ecosystem and serving the field in, you know, we have materials in 16 languages. I brought the Spanish ones here today. I've sent them to you in Turkish. Um, so, you know, what, uh, you know, we'd love to understand what more we could do to be more welcoming or inviting um, to our non-US uh, partners um, because we certainly uh, want and value them at the table and are very excited for the ones that we already have. Before I take, before we think, I just, I'm going to follow up and link this one to the previous section. We have our tools, and we always see something as an additional expense. Actually, I'm doing a nutrition course at the moment and about to be qualified nutritionist. I needed a nutritionist as I started nursing. I needed a nutritionist or a dietitian as I started life. And actually, if every primary care area has nutrition and every patient gets nutrition input, we become more aware of what we can maximize. And we are responsive to illness in the health services around the world. We need to be more proactive about wellness and only deal with illness that we need to. So it would be great to have one day that all liver disease treated by hepatologists is genetic and not lifestyle acquired. But actually, if we make the fundamental building blocks correct, yeah. we all need a nutritionist. Not one of us doesn't. There's something in my diet that's not great sometimes, and I know it. But actually, let's start with the building blocks. And this is where advocacy and everything, it's about let's maximize health before we get to illness. And now that doesn't mean we have to flip the whole service on its head. It means we just start assessing people better for their health. I did ITU, we did a systems approach. Every time we handed over neurological, renal, cardiovascular, liver, we did a systems approach to handing over. If we did a systems approach to assessment of our patients, we would actually find these coordinated areas. But everybody needs a nutritionist. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely not all genes. So it's very little time left, but please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Jorn, I'm going to challenge you for a second, sir, Me. if I may. <laughs> challenge um, the board here. <laughs> so we talked about nurses and the, the roles that nurses have. Now, coming from a pediatric and rare space, I'm very much about patient-reported outcomes, patient-reported experience, and using real-world data. Where would a hep C world be without specialist nurses? Where would cholestatic liver disease be without specialist nurses? Why do on earth do we need a trial to prove the role of nurses within NASH? Yeah, well, thanks for that. It's just not being paid for by my hospital. So I would need some yeah. data to support them uh, to implement this and uh, show them where the, where the wealth comes in. I think it's a systems failure. It's not me not wanting this. I think this is important. And I think this. that my new personal goal. So it's yeah. a little longer than getting you the money, um, but only my new personal goal. Yeah. Last question, please. Um, I'm just curious, how do you feel that the role of health communications could contribute uh, to the continuum of care in liver health and overall patient advocacy? Oh, it's huge. It's huge. Um, uh, we've, that's one of the reasons why we did the, you know, the language of NASH at the beginning, because it was being described in so many different ways. And as we were introducing this condition to the public and to pay policymakers and payers for the first time, we couldn't even agree amongst ourselves how to talk about it, what statistics to use. And so, um, you know, bringing in professional health communications uh, staff to pull that together, to try to go out with, with one voice and one message, hugely important. Yeah. So uh, this has been fantastic, I think. Um, it's, uh, to me, really, you know, learning from each other and, and asking the patient, not talking about the results, but talking about liver health, the, the role of physician assistants and nurses in this, and of course global 
uh, goals to achieve together and bring more power to the table, which uh, you know I'm taking back from this roundtable discussion, uh, um, uh, will be crucial to 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 move this forward. Uh, very much enjoyed this session. We are at the end. If anybody wants to. Uh, you know, conclude uh, and leave some final words from your side. Um, I'd like to say thank you, and um, uh, it's been a very informative uh, roundtable discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.